Good morning. We're really excited that you guys are here worshiping with us this morning. My name is Brandon Yee. This is Lauren, and we are the new Youth and Family Ministers for the Austin Christian. We hope you feel encouraged and excited this morning to worship God as we worship together with Northside, Tribe, and Eastside. We really hope that the word today, that the worship and all the different parts will help you feel like a part of our family. Out the wonder of life, and as you see a hundred billion galaxies are born in the 
Your heart and everything you've done. 
Hey, good morning, everyone. I want to thank the Northside worship team for their hard work putting together the worship for us this morning. It's great to be together. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the tribe. Welcome to the Northside. It's great having the opportunity for all of us to be tuned in together, worshiping God. We're continuing a series uh, this week entitled uh, More Than Conquerors. And the idea of that series is simply that we want to be conquerors, overcomers, if you will, in our faith. And I know that at a time like this, uh, certainly we are all looking to, uh, for ways to grow in our faith and, and, uh, and overcome in different ways. And so the title of my message this morning is simply this, Being in Control When Things Are Out of Control. I don't know about you, but uh, for me in my life, I like to be in control of things, uh, pretty much everything, really. Uh, I'm a dad, raised, uh, raised and am raising three daughters. And, you know, anytime something happens to one of my kids, you know, the, it, I get frustrated if there's not something that I can do about it. If a kid's up late at night, you know, vomiting because they're sick, I feel paralyzed because I can't control how they feel. I want them to feel better. Uh, and, you know, of course, that's when mom genes kick in for my wife and she gets in and she's so comforting. And I just get frustrated because I can't do anything about that. Or uh, if, you know, if they fall off the trampoline and, and hurt themselves, I might just take a knife and go out and cut the trampoline up because I can do something, you know. I might get angry, not at them, but because I just, I want to be able to do something because normally, ordinarily, I am able to control the things uh, in my life. And I've come to realize, and I'm still coming to realize, that certainly many, many, many things in our lives are beyond our control. And I think this current uh, quarantine type situation that we've had with uh, the, the, the coronavirus and whatnot has certainly demonstrated to all of us that we do lack a certain degree of control in our lives. There are things that are beyond our ability to do anything about. Uh, a couple weeks ago was my birthday and I turned 25, you know, really, you know, big milestone in my life. And, you know, we were celebrating with the family in the backyard. It was just me and, and Angela and the girls, and we sat out back, and it was a wonderful time with the family. But we couldn't help thinking that, you know, if this was a nor, nor, nor ordinary time, we would have tons of friends over. We would, have had a, we would have been in the park or in the backyard, you know, playing horseshoes and other things, and lots of friends. It would have been a big old barbecue. It would have been something pretty great. And there's a little bit of something missed there. And I you know, almost frustrating because we just can't control the situation. I'm so eager to get out. This week, of course, you know, the quarantine technically ends, but it doesn't really change a whole lot. But there's so much inside that wants just to jump back into normal life because that's familiar, that's what I know. And so I think we all wrestle with this in different ways. And for some of us, perhaps these, these things are, are much deeper and much more, um, much more hurtful if we're dealing with uh, stress of, of lo losing loved ones or, or sickness or, or things of that nature. Certainly, there are many things that are outside our control. And so this morning, I want us to take a look at a character in the Bible and see what we can learn from him. And that character is Job. And so uh, I want us to be turning our Bibles over to Job chapter 1. You know, I, I think that as we, we reflect on this feeling of being out of control, if you will, where things around us, we really can't do anything about it. Uh, there is a, a sense that we, do, we can do something, but what is it? And so let's read here in Job chapter 1. In verse 1 it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. You know, basically, you know, what they were saying is it sounds like, you know, for us in our years today, we think about having donkeys and camels, and we go, yeah, what's the big deal? The bottom line, this guy was loaded. He was rich. He, he had been very successful uh, in his life. And so in verse 4, we read on. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one, uh, each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, this, thus Job did continually. 
So here's the thing. I mean, this guy is like the picture of awesomeness. He is a successful businessman, very wealthy for in his time. You know, probably had the biggest house on the block. Uh, but but he's not just wealthy because he he somehow squ- you know he somehow cheated people or took advantage or so- in, in some kind of way or or even or even perhaps uh, inherited all that money. This he is he's a wealthy guy with a lot of character, so much so that even when his kids would get together and have a party, just in case just in case they might have sinned, he would get up early in the morning and go and make a sacrifice just to make sure, just in the off chance that somehow they might have slipped up and done something wrong. I mean, this is the, this is the character of Job. You know, we would look at him today and probably say, wow, that guy, that guy is blessed by God. That guy has what he has, you know, in, 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 because of God. And the implication would be that Job made good choices, and the consequences of Job, Job's choices were the reason, or, or his choices were the reason for the success that he had. He chose well, God blessed him, he had everything he needed. And that's kind of how we would, we would probably look at, at Job. And, and honestly, that wouldn't be entirely wrong. Certainly Job's success was probably due in large part to his integrity and the kind of person that he was. But that wasn't the only thing, and that, that's part of what the book of Job was going to wrestle with. But let's read on. In verse 6, this is what happens. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, you know, first, first thought here as we, as we think about this is that, you know, that's kind of problematic a little bit to our sense of justice. I mean, how could God even agree to set up Job like that, right? It, it triggers our sense of fairness and our sense of justice. And those sensitivities are, 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 are just enlightened by, uh, by what's going on here. However, if we read carefully, God's actually bragging on Job. And he's saying to Satan, look, you're out there trying to cause trouble. And you know what? You, you think people don't think much of me, but this guy, Job, he's doing it right, man. He has it all together. And, and so jo- God's bragging on Job. And of course, you know, Satan sort of fires back and says, well, yeah, you know what? I mean, he's only like that because you've given him everything, right? And, and so he, he, he loves you because you've given him what he wants. And, and of course, God knows that's not the case, but agrees to let Satan tempt him. And, you know, I'm not going to get into break, try to break down that part of the story today because I think that we have to understand something. We, as the reader of the story, are aware of the conversation that went on behind the scenes. Job himself is not. And so this story is as much about Job wrestling with his understanding of God and, and much more so than it is about, about whether or not God would allow such trouble into Job's life. And so it's, it's important for us to understand that. And so, you know, Job doesn't have an, any clue as to what's happening. He honors God and is grateful for what he has, but doesn't realize what's about to happen. We won't read the, re- uh, the next bit, of the, bit of, the, um, of the account, but I, I'll, I'll summarize by saying this. What happens next is breathtakingly horrible. Satan goes after Job. First, he loses all of his wealth. Then he loses all of his children. Then yeah, he basically loses everything. And to top it all off, he doesn't curse God. He, he doesn't... He doesn't uh, think a bad thing about God. And Satan comes after him again, and this time afflicts him personally so that he not only has lost his wealth and lost his his children, but he's also lost his own health. And he's sitting there, and in chapter 2 and verse 9, 
It says, then his wife comes to him and she says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I mean, this is, this is amazing. I mean, Job is, I mean, I don't think any of us could even begin to fathom the suffering that Job is going through. The suddenness with which he uh, absorbed all of these things that were happening to him. And, and yet, he didn't strike out at God and didn't blame God and didn't curse God for it. And so much so that his wife even looks at him and goes, dude, I mean, all this has happened. You might as well, it's over for you. Just curse God and die. This is, this is all you got. You, you had it. You lost it. I don't know what's going on, but it's over, buddy. And that, you know, really supportive wife there, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, but Job didn't curse God and all this. And I think about suffering, you know, in Job's life. And as we sort of try to make some applications, you know, suffering uh, actually should evoke worship and not cursing. You know, Job, and Job says, look, should I accept from God good things and not bad? There's a, there's a recognition in Job's life that God was worth glorifying and worshiping regardless of the circumstances and even and to some degree regardless of the blessings or the lack thereof. Job found his comfort in God, his hope, his allegiance, his joy, his identity, his satisfaction was not found in his possessions or even his family or, or, or these types of things, but he found those things in God. Now, as the book goes on, Job has three friends that come to encourage him. And, but the friends' basic message, all of them, they, there's three of them, the book's very long, and not, I can't read the whole thing today, but you can go back and read it on your own. Their, their argument is basically this. You know what? You somehow sinned, and you need to own your sin and if you own your sin, then all this will go away. You know, you need to own it, buddy, because you messed up. It's clear you messed up. And that's their message. Again, quite uh, an encouragement uh, from, his, from his buddies. But as, as the book goes on, Job sinks further and further into despair. And the, his depth of darkness actually does cause him to, at some point, finally question God's justice. And I think about that, and I think about when times get the darkest in our lives, when things are out of control, if you will, you know, we don't have any control of our situation, God tends to draw the fire. You know, that's your fault. God, why did you let this happen? Why would you do this to me? And, and you know, Job resisted that. He resisted it. But that is the temptation, when things are out of control, because we say when things are out of our control, they must be in somebody's control. That means God's pulling the strings and somehow He has done something to me or has done something to us. And, and so, you know, Job had no control over the situation. And, you know, and as I said, even so even as his friends tried to tell him that he was wrong in some way, it was their attempt to give Job control back. Hey, you can control this because you have sinned. You repent, you change, and your situation might be different. It all kind of goes back to this issue of control. Now, God comes on along and, and God answers. And I'm, I'm sort of abbreviating this whole argument in the whole book. Very, and, and this is a, this is a few, few words here. It uh, deserves much more. But he does. God does come and has a few words to say. So let's go to Job 38. In verse 38, after Job's friends make their case, Job defends himself. They make another case. He defends himself multiple times. Then God finally shows up and says, Hey, y'all need to shut up here for a minute and let me tell you what's, you know, let me tell you what's up. And in verse 38, verse 1, it says, The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Okay, so, you know, you basically got a whirlwind shows up and God starts speaking out of this thing. He says, Who is, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? And what were its bases sunk? And who laid its, found, its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. 
Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and the thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud ways be stayed. I mean, God comes on the scene and he says, Look, man, who are you to question me? Were you around in the beginning when I created everything? I mean, Basically, you know, he's saying to him, you know, who's your daddy? I mean, I'm the one who created all this. Why are you questioning me? Then he goes on in chapter 40. Of course, he goes on for quite a while. You can read God's entire response, which pretty much um, is very similar to those first verses. And then, you know, this is, this is the great part because, you know, Job, finally, after God's done saying some things and questioning why he's questioning him, then Job has this to say in verse 3, in verse 4, it says, Behold... I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but will, I will proceed no further. I mean, Job's like, yeah, I probably shouldn't say anything else. And of course, God doesn't stop there. He goes on and challenges Job again in verse 9, um, in, chapter, in verse 41, in verse 9. He says, Behold, the hope of a man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. And You know, God, in in the second section, God's describing these great beasts. And he says, look, you can't stand against those beasts. They're nothing compared to me. I am, I'm the creator of the universe. Who can stand before me? There's something much greater going on, essentially, is what he tells Job. In, the verse, in chapter 42, in verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you do, can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you may know, make it known to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And so, you know, Job hears all this and, and he's like, oh, man, I got to repent. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, right? And, and so as we, as we read this, we, the bottom line of this simply is this. What God says is that he alone holds the world together. And that maybe man has his righteousness, but that's, that's a very small understanding and God has his own understanding of what is righteous and what is right and what is fair and all of these things. And as we, as we consider the life of Job and even we consider our own lives and the things that we feel are, are right or fair or, you know, what is a blessing or what is a curse, all these things, you know, really at the end of the day, we need to stand in awe of God simply because of who he is. That was the answer God gave. God didn't even try to explain to Job, okay, so there was this meeting, we had a meeting in heaven, Satan came in, Satan said this, I said that, that's why, you know, that's why you're suffering. He didn't go into all, he's like, that's not, that's irrelevant, it's nuts beyond you. He said, look, it should be enough that I am God, and we should respect and honor and worship Him, right? And so, as we think about this, we want coming back now to, let's come back for a moment to this issue of control, because events can be beyond our control. And I believe that certainly, you know, in, in some respects, God is in God is certainly in control, but God hasn't taken control. Okay, He's in control of, you know, in a sense of of of, of, what, of the big picture, but He's not taking control from us. We do have some something to put into this. Okay, and so in other words, you know, we have our situations that that that, that happen around us that we cannot necessarily change. But what we can influence and we can have have some control over is how we respond and how we look and how we regard those things. And so for that, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I think, honestly, I think this, this verse sort of captures, I believe, Job's general response. Even though it was, well, wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, Job was a very righteous man and responded generally very well to what was an extraordinarily difficult uh, time uh, in his life. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, 
in verse 6. Peter's writing to the church at a time when they also are suffering in different ways, if you read uh, the entire book, and, or trying to letter, excuse me. In verse 6, he says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You know, there are several very practical things Peter tells us that I believe that we do have control over. When things are out of control, what can we do? Well, first of all, we can humble ourselves. We can be humble. It's the first thing Peter says to us. And I believe this is exhibited in the life of Job. You know, we can remember that God is still God and that His purposes extend beyond our own understanding. We can't control the situation, right? And you can't control God. And so to a certain degree, we have to have a, an inherent humility within ourselves that says, He is God, I am not. And that, that, that takes a lot, but it's a perspective as Christians, we have to understand that's something we can do. We can choose to say, I trust God, I don't understand fully, but He is God and I am not. You know, the second thing Peter says is that he does say that God will lift you up in due time. Now, what that means is, is that God's timing is different than our timing. You know, if it was up to me, my timing would have said this quarantine thing and all this nonsense would have ended, you know, a month ago. I was done after week two. But my timing is not God's timing. And, you know, there are many other things like that in my, in, in my life, and I'm sure in yours, where my timing and what I want is not, does not line up necessarily with what God wants. And we can't make it so. And so there is a, a, an, an element of surrender that we must have in our spirits and in our souls as we think about our relationship with God. And when we find that situations are out of control, We've got to surrender to the fact that God's timing is perfect and that in His time, the answers will come to us, the resolution will happen, but it only will happen when God decides it. I think the third thing Peter says is, cast all your anxiety on Him. You know, when you think well, the word cast actually, you know, it can mean to throw forcefully. Uh, you know, if you're going to cast a, a fishing rod, man, you're going to chuck it out there. You're not just going to flip it. It's, you know, well, depending on the size of the lake or river, I suppose. But, you know, it's, there's, a, there's an effort behind it. It's something that you do. That you use your strength. There's, a, there is a, there, there, there's force behind it. There's deliberation behind it. And when, when we think about our anxiety, we do love many times to sort of sit and soak in our anxiety, the things that concern us, the things that we're, we're afraid of. I mean, how many of us hasn't sat for hours at some point during the last month and a half and just and, and read through article after article about what could happen with the coronavirus. How fast can it spread? How bad can it be? How quick can it go? Where can you get it? And we just feed ourselves all these things and the anxiety just grows. And the Bible says, or Peter says, look, cast your anxiety and your fears on him. He's not saying being stupid. He just says, but put your anxiety, put your fear on God. Let, give it to him. Throw it away forcefully. Get rid of it. And that's challenging. I think it's challenging in our lives because, uh, you know, we tend to obsess over things that we're concerned about. And then that obsession then be turns into anxiety and the anxiety then becomes like this low-grade fever that, that, that really infects all that we are and erodes and destroys our faith. And the Bible says, get rid of the anxiety. Throw it away. Give it to God. Remember, you're not in control of the situation, but you are in control of your fears. And that you can throw. That you can get rid of. The other thing Peter says, he says, because he cares for you. Now, this is the interesting thing. Hold, you know, let's look over in James 5 for a moment, because James actually speaks to, um, to, to Job, actually, and uses Job as an ex in interesting example, because it says in verse 10, in James chapter 5, he says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, 
how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so, you know, he uses Job as an example of patience. And in the same story says, look, God is also an example of mercy and compassion. And so what Peter says to us is, he says, look, we should cast our anxiety on God because he cares for us. God is concerned. And so what a, what a great statement to understand that he cares for us. That's the reason why we can take our concerns and our fears to God. And then he goes on and and uh, Peter, that is, and he goes on to say the next challenge he gives us, you know, in terms of what can we do when things are out of control, we can be alert and we can be sober minded. And I want to return back to Job, if I could, because in Job 28, this is an interesting little passage in the, in the book of Job. If you, if you study it, ever study it out, you know, there's all these um, conversations going on. You know, this friend says this, this friend says that, Job responds, and this friend says it. In the middle of all of this, in chapter 28, is like an interlude. They call it an interlude. And it's this, it's essentially this, this uh, poem-ish kind of thing. You know, we're not sure, did Job say this, or is this just kind of an, in, kind of a, an insert into the story? But basically, it, it describes wisdom. And in Job chapter 28 and verse 12, it says this. It says, But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not in with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all the living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. And he said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. You know, what the writer here, you know, what, what, what Job says is simply, look, you can look all over for wisdom. You know, you can look throughout all creation. You can't pay for it. You can't buy it. It's not worth, you can't go and find the most beautiful jewel. You can't pay for it with a pearl. It's, it's better than gold. It's above all these things. And the only way to find, even, even death itself has only kind of heard a, a, a little bit about it. Like, hmm, something's out there. You know, only God understands everything fully. Now, if you think about that, that takes a little bit of the pressure off of all of us. We can't control everything. We can't even possibly understand everything. But we can trust God who does. You know, and he says here at the end of it, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. You know, though we can't see through the mystery of suffering, we still can hold fast to the fear of the Lord. You know, and I think about that, and it's so important for us as we, you know, what can we do when things are out of control? We can trust and hope and stand firm in God. And if we go back to Peter, that's exactly what he says in the end. He says, stand firm in your faith. In other words, you know, let's focus on the things that we can do and not focus on the things that we can't change. You know, there are certain things that are beyond our control, and we need to leave those with God. But the things that we can control are how we think about those things that we can't. And so maybe an exercise you could consider doing as you think about this and how to put this into practical use in your life is, is, you, is you think about things perhaps that, that you can, that you, you know, what's, a, what's a problem that you have? And, you know, and, and so instead of thinking about that problem that you're in, what are the ways, think, think differently, what are the ways that God can use me in this situation. You know, if you're if you're struggling 
you know, financially, let's just use that as an example. You know, I, this is bad. I could focus all my attention on that and, and try to take, you know, take things into my own hands. And certainly there are things and stuff we can take. But, but what can God do in this situation? How can God use me in this situation to bless others? Regardless of the situation, maybe you find yourself in, a, you know, you're sick and, and, and struggling with, with illness of some kind. Well, I can't control that. But what I can control is how I view it. It's actually an opportunity perhaps to minister to others, to demonstrate the life of Jesus or, or the, you know, to demonstrate the spirit of Jesus to others as I, as I myself wrestle through this difficulty in my life. If we were to approach everything that way, boy, it would, it would change, I think, the way we understand um, control. In a sense, we release control to God. In a sense, we take control of the things that we can and, the, and that control simply has to do with our response to the things that are going on around us. I think it's important to remember that God is in control, but He has not taken control. And so I, my prayer for us all is that we would strive to influence others from within our struggles. Let's stop trying to get rid of the struggles. Let's stop trying to you know, control them away. Let's, let's, let's embrace the place where we are at this moment, whether that's a great place or a difficult place, and let's embrace that and let's demonstrate the Spirit of Jesus uh, within the situations that we find ourselves in much the same manner that Job did. You know, if we, if we wrap up the story of Job in chapter 42, it says in verse 10, it says, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You know, we like happy endings. Uh, I think that's kind of an American thing for sure. Uh, and, and, and certainly Job's story has a bit of a happy ending in, his, in a sense that he, you know, God blessed him again. And the second half of his life was, was, was even more prosperous than the first. Uh, I don't know that that would take away from the suffering that he experienced. But at the same time, we understand something. Job actually blessed others in the midst of his own suffering. He prayed for his friends. He did not cave to their wrong thinking, but actually influenced their thinking about God. We still, to this day, thousands of years later, we still read his story and we still benefit from it. We still learn and we are blessed by Job's suffering. And I really believe that God can be glorified and that people can be blessed through our suffering if we just let go of control to God and we, we control the things that we can uh, do something about. And so as we think about those things, you know, let's, let's reflect on that. At this time, uh, we're going to, uh, I've asked Charles Mims to uh, share, uh, to share a, a, a little bit from his own life. And I believe that we'll add some, add some insight into uh, to our sermon today. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Charles Mims, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, some things that, that I experienced last year and that I'm still, still going through emotionally. Um, I lost my uncle um, last year in May. Um, and got the, got the message from, um, from my mom when I was at work. This was give or take it was around nine in the morning when I got the phone call um, I got it from the from my desk and, and ran to the back to uh, to talk to her about what was going on and and she explained to me you know that he took his life uh, which was very hard to believe uh, that my uncle would, would take his life uh, we grew up together um, the first four years of my life I lived with him uh, with my mom my dad we all lived with my grandparents um, even when they moved away uh, when I was four, I still stayed with my grandparents. And my uncle, his name was Garland, Garland Douglas, was like my big brother. He taught me everything. Music, how to sing, rap, dance, fight, everything. Um, so losing him was uh, very difficult. And I was starting to wrestle with uh, my own self-worth. Like, uh, you know, do I even belong here? You know, what kind of impact am I leaving on people's lives? 
you know, whose, lives, whose life am I touching you know, each day? And all the missed opportunities. And I bring up the missed opportunities because um, my uncle and I had a falling out you know, back in 1991. It's almost 30 years ago. And um, over a girl, and we never really uh, resolved it. So that was the hardest thing, uh, to know that I'm going to his funeral and giving the eulogy and not having that relationship resolved, at least in my eyes. I shared with the brother uh, a while back that if I ever step back from the music ministry to, to challenge me on it because chances are there's sin involved um, and, and at this moment, moment in time I had to step back and be okay with it because you know, I felt like my life was out of control. I, I, even though I would try to serve um, it was it was hard. It was hard to serve. It was hard to serve and and give give of myself fully. I really felt like I didn't have much to give. So I stepped back for about two months, and um, during that time, I had some brothers uh, reach out to me. And uh, the only two that uh, come to my mind right now are, are you know, forgive me if you if you've already have reached out to me, but are. Yves Hood and, and Jeff Mercer. And to give a picture of how out of control you know, my emotions and my mind was, um, leaving dinner uh, one evening, I made a turn uh, down the wrong way of the road. And, um, and I was driving opposite the flow of traffic and Yves ran me down. Um, it was letting me know that I was going the wrong way. Um, and you know, he was like, dude, you." You want to stay here? You're all right. You need to stay and talk. And I'm like, no, I, I got to go home. And um, but he he bought some time. We talked a little bit, and headed out headed out home. I had to be okay with uh, being depressed, uh, and and being okay with with the time that it was going to take to heal, because it's all in God's time. Um, it's up to Him how long it takes for our hearts to heal. And I had to let him have his way with my life by continuing to obey him, continue to be in the scriptures and allow people to speak to me, uh, speak through him to me. Um, and not feel like there was a, you know, a jab at, you know, asking, you know, how am I doing or, or how am I getting along with uh, losing him? Because to this very day, I, I think of him often. I feel like the the best way to sum up this year this past year is uh when when everyone was getting ready to leave because of how hard jesus's teachings were and um, so many of them left hundreds of them took off and and he turned around and asked peter you know are you going to leave too and he said you know no lord where am i going to go you know you have the words of life um, So I feel like that's where I, where I stand, you know, Jesus is Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. You know, at this time, we're going to go ahead and take communion. And uh, whether you're at home, uh, some of us are going to take communion immediately uh, after I pray. Others of us may be gathering in small groups uh, to spend a little bit more time uh, in communion and prayer together. Um, regardless, I'm going to say a prayer now for, uh, for communion. And we do this every week to remember Jesus, to remember His um, sacrifice for us that He gave of His life, uh, His blood, His body uh, was broken for us. We remember that and we proclaim His death and His resurrection until He comes. It's, it's the core of our belief, uh, the core of our, our beings uh, as disciples of His. And so as we take this time now, uh, please pray with me as we uh, reflect on Jesus' sacrifice for us. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for Jesus, and thank you for the sacrifice that he made for each one of us. And God, as we reflect on the life of Job and how uh, he was able to learn through his own suffering how to rely on you and, and to control simply how he looked at things, um, God, we, we're inspired by that. God, Jesus certainly was an even greater example of that. God, he uh, certainly did your will and was, was, was submissive to your will in his life even though he uh, made choices uh, to give of himself and 
the grace of those choices was simply to give his life uh, for us. And God, we are deeply and eternally grateful for that. And I pray now as we take the bread, take the cup, that we be mindful of that, God, that it would impact us and move us. And, uh, and God, I pray that our, our faith uh, would grow daily as we walk uh, with him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So glad you could join us today. If you'd like to know more about us or engage in some Bible studies, please see the website below. Also, if you're watching in real time, check out our Northside and Tribe Facebook pages for links to Zoom Fellowship following service.